following is a CUNY TV special presentation. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone had a, a great holiday and a wonderful summer. And seeing everyone here this morning makes me feel like uh, we're back in session also. Now looking to the future and the formal opening of the new Cornell Tech Campus uh, next week. It is a welcome addition to our city's expanding tech ecosystem. Science, tech, and innovation continues to play a greater part of New York City's economy not only on Randall's Island, but all over Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. And we look uh, across the river uh, I had on this beautiful morning, which it's turned out to be, uh, and I can think of no better uh, setting to welcome Cornell University's new president, Martha Pollack, to Abney community. To introduce President Pollack, I want to introduce the chairman of related companies, Steve Ross, Steve has played a critical role in the development of Cornell Tech. Not only is he on the board of overseers, but he has also made a significant mark on the physical campus. As you look at Roosevelt Island, a 26-story high rise stands out, and deservedly so. It is the world's tallest passive house residential building developed by related companies in Hudson. This building is a symbol of what Cornell Tech stands for, innovation and sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chairman of Related, Steve Ross. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Martha, this is for you. <laughs> Jesus, I don't know how you Anyway, um, that was the University of Michigan fight song. Uh, for those of you who know, um, I'm somewhat associated with Michigan, and uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be working with them. But it was where I really met uh, uh, Martha Pollack, and I'm very honored to be able to introduce uh, Martha uh, uh, Pollack here to, to Abney. Um, I met Martha many years ago, prior, before she's even provost at the University of Michigan. Uh, we sat next to each other uh, at, at numerous meetings, and uh, listened to her presentations, and uh, I think you always came away from that knowing who the smartest person in the room was. Um, I think people here using her knowledge in technology and being a computer scientist and her and knowledge in artificial intelligence, together with her compassion for students and learning, uh, she was just a great provost. And as I sat there through the years and listened to her and having spoken with her in between and learned an awful lot, you know, I, I couldn't help but wonder I, that knowing that Michigan was a place where many college presidents have come from, that it was just a question of how long would Martha be able to stay at the University of Michigan before she was offered uh, presidency of a great university. And that she was, and uh, it was really uh, Michigan's loss in New York, and Cornell's gain as well as New York City. Um, and I, I think she will be great things to Cornell, but just as important, she's going to be one of the really most major leaders here in New York, um, because there's no one really more qualified to lead both Wild Cornell Medical in the future, as well as launch uh, Cornell Tech. Uh, Cornell Tech is really, uh, I think next week we have our opening in, uh, the, uh, of the campus on Roosevelt Island. and. Um, what, what that university and Cornell Tech will mean to the future of New York City, I think, is extremely important to all of us. I mean, tech, as we all know, is where the world is going. And if you're not embracing tech, uh, you're not really going to grow as a city. And New York certainly has embraced it. And I think that the idea of, of Cornell Tech coming here and what it will do in really educating uh, students from around the world in the new ways of really doing things and taking a total different approach uh, to education, uh, there's nobody better that can really lead the way uh, than Martha Pollack. And I think that will also lead to 
lead the way for the continuance of New York is growing our economy. And uh, when you look at Silicon Valley and you see what Stanford has done for that whole area, and knowing uh, that technology is taking such an important part in, in our lives and in business, that I think it can do the same thing to continue to New York to be the greatest city in the world. So I, I'm really thrilled that uh, Cornell was able to get Martha as, as um, the, pre the 14th president of Cornell. I congratulate you on that. And really, I think New York is really going to benefit by her. And I just hope, I know she'll still be, have a little bit of Wolverine left in her. So, so Martha, it's a real pleasure to introduce you and thrilled that you're here. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Steve, for that really wonderful introduction. And, and thank you for your visionary leadership in New York City um, and for your service as a member of the Cornell Tech Board of Overseers. We're just so pleased to have you as part of our team there. Um, and as we look to enhance this great city through an innovative kind of graduate education, your work across New York inspires us. Under your leadership, the related companies have become a global leader in real estate innovation and a dominant force here in New York. On the west side, Hudson Yards is providing a model for the city of the future. I, I'm going to have to start pumping my hand on that. <laughs> um, and, now, and now there's this new Cornell Tech campus, which, which you really helped us build with a residential building that is among the world's most sustainable. I'm a tenant in that building when I'm in New York City. I stayed there last night. I can tell you it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, so thank you for all you do, Steve, for New York and Cornell. I also want to thank, I don't know who in this room was involved in getting the ferry up and running, but I took the ferry down from Roosevelt Island this morning. Fabulous. Just a wonderful way to get around. So thank you to whoever has, who's put that into place. Um, I also want to thank Bill Rudin, Angela Pinsky, and Abney for having me here this morning. Um, everybody knows that speaking before Abney is a rite of passage, and I really truly am honored to be here today with all of you. I'll talk today about Cornell's impact on so much of what makes New York special, but it really starts with the more than 50,000 Cornell alumni who live in the region. Can I ask all the Cornellians here to stand up? Okay, wow, right? <laughs> Give them a round of applause. Cornell parents, all Cornell parents stand up. Yeah. <laughs> Cornell alumni are leaders and pioneers in business, in finance, art, culture, science, healthcare, law, public service, tech, fashion, hospitality, cuisine, the list goes on and on. And I've already discovered that you really can't go far walking around the city without running into one. So did you know that the Empire State Building was designed and built in 1931 by the firm of Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon, one of whose principals and the person credited with the building's quick complete, completion was a Cornelian, R.H. Shreve. And the Tony Award winning play, Indecent, which was a highlight of this year's Broadway season, it was written by a Cornelian, Pulitzer Prize winner Paula Vogel. And New York City's favorite casual burger shack, burger joint, shake shack, burger joint, shake shack. It's also led by a Cornellian, Randy Garuti. But of course, Cornell's presence in New York City is about institutions as much as individuals. While Cornell Medicine, a global leader in patient care, science discovery, and education of future physicians, has been in New York City for more than 100 years. We treated more than 2.9 million patients last year and brought more than $240 million worth of research funding to New York. Already, while Cornell and Cornell Tech are collaborating on exciting new health tech initiatives that wouldn't have been possible before. Our physical footprint in the city also includes programs from the Colleges of Art, Architecture, and Planning, the School of Industrial and Labor Relations, the College of Engineering, Cornell's Law School, the Faculty of Computing and Information Science, and the Cornell S.C. Johnson College of Business, along with numerous academic and research programs offered by really programs across Ithaca. Provo this proves that a 225 mile separation is really nothing for Cornellians who are always intrepid. 
Cornell Cooperative Extension in New York City is active in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and Staten Island. With a goal to meet New Yorkers in their homes, churches, schools, and other community spaces, our extension programs support tens of thousands of New Yorkers annually in a neighborhood by neighborhood and person by person demonstration of Cornell's land grant mission. While nutrition education programs boast the broadest reach, our collective impact includes evidence-based community outreach programs in 4-H youth development, parenting, energy conservation, and STEM education. For more than 100 years, Cornell has been integrated into the fabric of New York City, delivering research-based solutions that enhance diverse industries, improving the lives of millions while transforming the city's landscape, and nurturing the talented people from a, across a wide spectrum of fields who together make New York the greatest city in the world. I'm a little bit biased. I grew up in Stamford, Connecticut. My dad worked in Manhattan. My relatives were in Brooklyn. But this really is the greatest city in the world. The Cornell story goes back to the mid-19th century, to Ezra Cornell, the farmer mechanic, and Andrew Dixon White, the history professor, who together created Cornell. The Cornell alumni in the audience will know the story of two very different men who, while serving together as New York State Senators, saw in the Morrill Act of 1862, the federal statute that established land-grant colleges, an opportunity to create not just a new college, but a new kind of college a college at once committed to the liberal arts and sciences and to developing talent in a wide range of professional fields, a college that would welcome people of all backgrounds without regard to race, gender, religion, or national origin, something we still stand for today, and a college whose graduates, like Cornell itself, would contribute to the betterment of society. So when the opportunity arose in 2010 to compete for a second land grant here in Manhattan, in New York, in New York Cornell University seized it for a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to build on our founding vision while having a transformative impact on New York City's future. And next Wednesday, joined by elected officials, by Michael Bloomberg, and by our academic partner, the Technion, Israel, Tech, Israel Institute of Technology, one of the biggest projects Cornell has ever undertaken will officially open on Roosevelt Island, Cornell Tech, the first of its kind campus built for the digital age. Our journey to Roosevelt Island began seven years ago when the Bloomberg administration issued a challenge to top institutions worldwide to develop an applied sciences campus on city-owned land with a seed investment of $100 million. We partnered with the Technion, the university behind Israel's remarkable startup economy, and we won the competition in 2011. Cornell Tech presented an opportunity that is almost unheard of today to build a new type of academic program and a new type of campus from scratch. Thanks to the extraordinary ingenuity of former Mayor Michael Bloomberg and the terrific partnerships with Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio, for the past five years we've been busy building, building an academic program in Google's facility in Chelsea and building a remarkable physical campus on Roosevelt Island. So what have we come up with and how is it different? It starts with our approach, which builds on what is best about the startup culture. We said from the beginning that we would take chances at Cornell Tech, that we wouldn't be afraid to fail or to scrap something that wasn't working. Now, I'm a computer scientist by training, and in computer science, we're taught to build th things through what we call iterative design. So you start by creating a system that represents an initial approximate solution to a problem, then you test it in the real world, then you refine it, and you repeat the cycle. And that's exactly what we've been doing at Cornell Tech. We've iterated, creating, testing, and refining an academic program under the leadership of Dean Dan Huttenlocker. And it's reinventing graduate education for the first time in three generations. Let me be a little bit specific about what I mean by that. First, at Cornell Tech, there are no disciplinary silos. Every one of our master's students spends about a third of their time in a studio program creating products and solving problems, engineering students, with business students, with law students, with computing and information science students. It's true that the fastest way to find a solution to a problem is to bring together a group of like-minded people. But the only way to get to the best solution is to gather a diverse set of voices representing a variety of backgrounds and disciplines. Ezra Cornell and Andrew Dixon White knew that when they created Cornell, and we still firmly believe that today. Okay, second example at Cornell Tech. 
Academia and industry go together there, hand in hand. We're assembling some of the finest research teams in the world, but I have to tell you that what excites me is that their research will be put to use immediately and in the real world. Companies are a permanent part of the tech campus, ensuring collaboration that accelerates commercial innovation. Our students and researchers will interact with startups, entrepreneurs, investors, and established companies, all in the pursuit of commercial innovation. For some, this has been controversial, but it's a tension that we've embraced and we've made it a central feature of Cornell Tech. And third, at Cornell Tech, the campus is designed to be open. The Emma and Georgiana Bloomberg Center, our first academic building, has no offices. Professors and PhD students work in open floor plans and small breakout rooms. This setup promotes intensive collaboration and discovery, but it can be a shock to the system. It's a real shock to the system for those of us who come from academia. I, I see Deborah Estrin laughing there. You can't imagine going to a faculty member and saying, no, you're not going to have an office. You're going to be in an open floor plan. And yet, it's worked. I, I was taking some people on a tour there recently, and one of them asked, where do your books go? <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, this is innovative. Cornell Tech is innovative in so many ways. Its design, for example, is one of the most sustainable in the world. But I'm most proud of its openness. We've created a campus that's not only open internally but externally. It's accessible to all New Yorkers and especially to our Roosevelt Island neighbors with two and a half acres of open space and no gates, no walls, and no barriers. The results are already impressive, but the potential is transformative. We can't do it alone, but success here means nothing less than creating a new economic engine that will drive New York forward for generations to come. When we officially open Cornell Tech next week, it will be a massive milestone for Cornell and for New York City, the introduction of something truly innovative. Yet, as I've already mentioned, at Cornell, the principles at play are not new. They build on what has made us special for more than 150 years, providing a distinctive and distinguished education to produce graduates who make a positive impact on society. At Cornell, we have an unusually fierce commitment to the idea that the liberal arts on the one hand and professional study across a swath of disciplines on the other are synergistic and mutually reinforcing. We're extraordinarily broad, we're an Ivy League college, and we're a land-grant university. As Professor Carl Becker said in 1940, universities must promote the humane and rational values which are essential to the preservation of democratic society. Today, that responsibility feels more important than ever, and Cornell Tech is an important part of how we fulfill it. So let me take a moment and talk about an aspect of that, this moment that is especially important to me. When I was in my first few years as a computer science professor at Michigan, there were more faculty members in the department named Igor than there were female faculty members. There were two Igors, and there was me. <laughs> in many respects, things have gotten a lot better. That's a true story. <laughs> this year, 51% of the incoming class and 48% of the entire undergraduate population in Cornell's College of Engineering is female, a trend that we're starting to see at other elite universities across the country. But we also know that diversity continues to be a massive problem in the tech sector. And given the importance of tech sector growth to our economy, that's a problem for all of us. To quote Judy Spitz, our terrific partner from Verizon, who is spearheading Cornell's, Cornell Tech's Women in Technology program, which we call Whitney, quote, we can't solve the workforce issue with literally half the team sitting on the bench. Over the long term, New York's competitive, competitiveness will depend on our ability to better prepare young people with the skills to succeed in a digital economy. And we have a moral responsibility to ensure that the pipeline we're creating is as inclusive and diverse as New York City itself. At Cornell Tech, we're attacking the problem at each step of the educational process, partnering with the City of New York, with CUNY, and with many of our peers in the tech sector. The work starts at the K-12 level, where we are bringing to bear our two most precious resources, faculty and students. Our faculty members provide expert guidance, while our growing student body is the volunteer workforce on the ground. Under the leadership of Diane Levitt, who's here today? Diane, where are you? There's Diane Levitt. We are engaging with partners across the educational spectrum to train teachers, build curricula, and connect schools to services and funding opportunities that can have a valuable influence on student learning. 
While many excellent programs target students directly, we have focused most of our efforts on teachers for two reasons. First, the shortage of teachers qualified in the tech fields is holding back the city's intent to reach every student. And second, it is much more efficient to train a teacher who can then reach thousands of students over the course of a career. This is our way of supporting Mayor de Blasio's Computer Science for All initiative. We're actively working with over a dozen schools, and our work has impacted over 5,000 students and 350 teachers to date. Reaching students early in the learning process is critical, but equally important is seeing them through the key years of transition from high school to college, when groups underrepresented in tech are most likely to choose a different path. Here, we've partnered with CUNY, with its reach across the city, and with one of the most diverse student bodies in the country. With the Whitney program, we're working to expose more women at the undergraduate level to computer science in order to help diversify the tech talent pipeline in New York. We know that there isn't just one factor that blocks women from entering computer science, so our strategy is multi-pronged and persistent. It starts even before students arrive on campus, immersing them in a supportive tech culture and aiming to whet their appetite for learning more. <clears throat> An innovative introductory curriculum welcomes them to campus, followed by efforts to retain them through scholarship incentives, career immersion, and mentorship from some of the most accomplished women in New York. The curriculum that we developed with CUNY has been implemented at more than a dozen CUNY campuses with 2,000 students participating each year. To me, this represents the brilliance of the journey that this city launched seven years ago. Yes, we've built a campus like no other and are placing on it academic programs that re-envision graduate education for the digital age. Yes, we've brought a global academic partner to New York City. And yes, we've helped create a new catalyst for the explosive growth of New York's tech economy. But because this is a public-private partnership, a land grant for the 21st century, we are also committed to programs that go far beyond Roosevelt Island and reach far more people than will ever gain degrees from Cornell Tech. As I've come to quickly appreciate since starting my presidency, Cornell is nearly ubiquitous in New York State. There are Cornellians and Cornell-influenced businesses and programs and activities across the state in all of its counties and all five boroughs of the city. With the opening of Cornell Tech, we have a new vehicle for transformation and change, and we will use it to continue growing our impact and our footprint in New York City. We will work diligently for a future in which all groups are included in the conversation, and at Cornell Tech, as at all our campuses, we will continue to work towards a community that is truly diverse, inclusive, and egalitarian. And at Cornell Tech, as on our other campuses, we will always be focused on making a difference in the world. I've said many times that Cornell's original campus in Ithaca is and will remain at the heart of the university. But extraordinary opportunities arrive from our expansion into New York City, cultural opportunities, opportunities for more immediate access to industry, opportunities to engage firsthand in developing solutions to the challenges of an urban setting in a world that is increasingly urban. Just as we have a long tradition of recognizing and building on the liberal, the complementary strengths of the liberal arts and the applied fields of study, just as we've been able to successfully combine Ivy League values with those of land-grant colleges, so too will we combine and benefit from the synergistic advantages of our rural and our urban campuses as one Cornell. I invite you to join us in this extraordinary partnership in service to the city, the state, and the world. And I invite you to visit us right up there on our new 21st century land-grant campus. Thank you very much. Questions uh, for the president? I'll, I'll start. How many students do you uh, anticipate starting, and what's the, what's the total goal of, of students coming through uh, the, the school? Um, yeah, so right now we have about 325 students, give or take a few, including 40 PhD students. Um, by 2027, which is when we finish phase two, there'll be about 850 students, and then in the long run, there'll be several thousand. Nobody has any questions. Over here. So. Over here. What was the most unexpected thing that's happened to you, both in New York City and New York State? In New York City and New York State. Um, you know, 
in New York City, so I visited Roosevelt Island just a few days after I was named president. I came down to meet people in New York. And you know, you could sort of see the campus taking shape. Maybe I'm not imagining enough, but I have been stunned at how fabulous it actually turned out. It's, it's beyond my wildest imaginations. <laughs> I'll, I'll wave to you from my apartment. Yeah, um, um, th th that has really been a, an incredibly pleasant surprise. I, I, as far as um, Cornell overall, I, I think uh, Steve Ross will, will appreciate this. What's been a surprise to me is how few surprises there have been. It, it turns out that I'm the sixth out of 14 presidents of Cornell to come from Michigan. And in retrospect, I, yeah. <laughs> and in retrospect, I don't think that's an accident. I think the, the, the big and large and complex, I think the um, sort of private, you know, Cornell's a, a private university with a, with a public sort of mission. Michigan is a public university with private sort of academics. I think the longstanding commitment to diversity, it's been surprising. I mean, there's differences. Cornell has its own culture for sure, but hasn't been as surprising as I thought. Is there going to be a um, combination of uh, opportunities for both uh, students in Ithaca, Ithaca and in New York City to pr kind of going back and forth? Yeah, I mean the the master's and PhD program is for students who will be primarily based here, but we have a number of programs that bring students uh, back and forth for short visits, for summers, um, our law, there's an opportunity for law students to spend a semester here. We're looking on lots of different ways to bring students, and, and vice versa, bring Cornell student tech students up to Ithaca as well. How much, what percentage of your students come from abroad, different countries, throughout the whole grad program? Um, you know, I don't have those numbers. Deborah, do you happen to know? Um, we are less than, I'm going to get this wrong, Juliet. Um, anybody behind, I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, across our master's programs, it's less than half, it's less than half which is, uh, to some of you who are not in engineering, might seem like a large number, and those of you who are engineering will recognize it as a as a uh, high domestic uh, proportion. Yeah, Bob. Yeah, any uh, special linkages to uh, Technion in uh, Israel and their programs? Um, yeah. So the the Jacobs Technion uh, Institute, which is within Cornell Tech, is directly and intimately linked with the Technion. That program has two hub programs. One is in what's called connected media, and one is in with health technology. It works directly with uh, faculty from the Technion who spend time here. Um, so there there are a lot of linkages there. One of the components of the original master plan was a hotel. Can you give us an update on? The status. Uh, it's it's in planning. There is so that you know there are three buildings on the campus right now. There is um, the the Bloomberg Center, which is the main class. It's not really classrooms because it's open plan, but the educational building. There is the bridge, which is a building that does co housing for industry for corporate partners, and then open space for students who are working on the island. And then there's the residential building. There are two more buildings that are now in planning. Uh, one is the hotel that you mentioned, and the other is a, an executive education center. So we're hoping to get those things up within the next couple of years. Final question, yes. Down the road, are there any plans to integrate the undergraduate university in Ithaca with the Cornell Tech program here in New York? No, Cornell Tech is a graduate only pro, uh, is a graduate only set of programs. It's masters and PhDs. That said, there are plans for visiting opportunities for students, undergraduate students, to come down and have short stays here, perhaps in the summer, perhaps in intersessions, so that they get the advantages of the urban um, experience. But we're not going to have degree programs for them here. We strongly believe that an important part of the undergraduate experience is the breadth of intellectual exposure that you get on a campus like, like Cornell, and Cornell Tech is not suited for that. President Pollack, thank you very much. We wish you Godspeed. It's very exciting.